So far in our look at Sega's arcades, we've mainly kept our feet on the ground. We've looked at their system board games which for the most part are standard games complete with standard cabinets. But as fantastic and as classic as the best games from those selections are, they may not be the best representation of just what Sega arcades are all about. Sega arcades are about being eye catching as all hell, right from the off. The centrepiece of an arcade, the one that's always got a line. Hell, there's a few games that have featured in the list so far that I've had a little bit of a blind spot on purely because I'm not aware of the cabinet that they come in. Take Hot Rod for example. On the surface it's a pretty generic top down racer, innit? But as people pointed out, it supports 4 players and it came in a big cocktail cab where everyone has a steering wheel and there's a giant bar with Hot Rod plastered and lit up all over it. That sort of thing makes a difference. You see that, you're gonna wanna play it. And so, in this video, we're looking at the games that came in the big cabinets, the ones that are perhaps the most impactful in Sega's whole arcade history. Finally, we're looking at the super scalers, we're looking at the vectors, we'll even have a little look at some of the most eye-catching games from the very early days. While we may not be able to play virtually any of the electro-mechanical and discrete logic titles, at least not in the original form, we can still cool the wonderful machines. And this list isn't going to be a regular countdown because, well it's kind of hard to do that with these games. The spectacle is often as important, if not more important, than the game. Let's take G-Lock as an example. Not a bad game, but when you just play it on main you may just think that it's a graphically nice arcade flight game that's a little slow paced and not a lot more. And yet, well, that's kind of missing the point. G-Lock becomes a wholly different matter when you play it in its afterburner on steroids deluxe cabinet, or even better than that, on the R360 cab that the game was designed for that will literally turn the player upside down. You can't replicate that in MAME. So instead we're going to go chronologically through these games, just because it'll be a bit fairer that way. And it goes without saying that in this video, you're going to see a big chunk of Sega's most famous arcade machines. These represent the cream of the crop, they are justifiably famous and you'll know them off by heart. And yet there's still a couple of gems you may not know quite so well. Let's start by going way back then, all the way to the 1960s. Where exactly do we start then? That's a tough one. Sega did a fair few electro-mechanical games and it's no small feat to pick out the ones that particularly stand out. Especially when, you know, it's very hard to experience these games nowadays. They're not emulatable in MAME of course, seeing as they were made using electronic circuits and dealt primarily with the movement of physical objects. Hell, most of them didn't even have a screen or any kind of projection until the late 60s when the projection of animated images started to become more common in these games, and in fact Sega were trendsetters in this regard. But perhaps Sega's biggest innovation in this era, if not the biggest innovation in their entire history, came in 1969 when they released a game called Missile. Not only is this game a pretty awesome looking cabinet chock full of cool dials, a radar and a display where the enemy planes and tank that you control are projected onto, it is also the earliest known arcade game to feature a joystick and fire button. So in short, it's the arcade equivalent of the invention of the wheel. Who do we have to thank for innovations like these then? Well that would be Sega's first arcade master. Before Makoto Uchida, before Yu Suzuki, before everyone else, there was Hisashi Suzuki. When Suzuki joined Sega in 1962, the company wasn't even Sega, it was officially Nihon Kikai Seizu, previously the manufacturing arm of Service Games Japan. In 1964 this company merged back with Nihon Goraku Busan, previously the distribution arm, to create Sega Enterprises Limited, and that's where things would stay for the next 30 odd years. Hisashi Suzuki would be there for this whole period, primarily as the head of the production and engineering department. As such, most of Sega's famous electromechanical machines are his. This one, Periscope from 1966, is his first. In fact, it's Sega's first big arcade hit. 
While not exactly original and pretty much adopted from a Namco arcade of the same name, this was a huge hit all over the arcade world. As old as it is, it's got all manner of blinking lights and even sound, both mechanically created and from a soundboard, and as simple as it is, it stands out as a beautiful machine, apparently the first machine that charged a quarter per play. Periscope is an important part of the company's history for sure, and it can at the very least be sort of enjoyed in a later game. There's a simulation of the game in the PS2 Sega Ages port of Dynamite Dika. The formula for Periscope would be adapted into other games, such as the aforementioned Missile, as well as the likes of 1969's Duck Hunt, another influential title which made use of video projection to produce animations of moving ducks on a screen that could then be shot down. This right here is thought to be the first game that offered a first person perspective. It's not all shooting either. Here you've got Grand Prix, also from 1969. This is a racing game of sorts where you have to avoid other cars, although unlike earlier examples of this sort of game, it again uses video projection. This is another example of a clone becoming more famous than an original. The game Indy 500 by a company called Casco came first, but Grand Prix by Sega is more famous. More ambitious still is Jet Rocket from 1970. Once again we have targets to shoot, but this game actually gives you a 3D landscape that you can move around in freely in order to locate the targets. Not bad for the time and Jet Rocket can actually be considered the first flight simulation game. Some would even call it the first sandbox title, or even the first action adventure game. In any case, Hisashi Suzuki's influence on the world of arcades is basically incalculable. All of the games just mentioned were either his directly, or they were produced under his watch, along with many other electromagnetic games by the company. The ones I've mentioned are the most influential, although there are others that are also known through things like little cameos in media, such as 1972's Killer Shark, famed mainly for its brief appearance in Jaws. This is just a little surface scratch, it's hard to go too much further, especially without experience in these machines. Alas, that's difficult. These machines are pretty rare in general, and it's even rarer to find one that's actually in good working order because, I mean, they're so old. Still, they're quite something. Even if they're not strictly video games, they sure look a hell of a lot like them. And the next step on the ladder would basically be the link between this sort of title and the conventional video game. The Discrete Logic arcade game. So, what is Discrete Logic? If you look under the hood of a traditional electromechanic game, you'll find a lot of wires. There'll be one or more circuits working together, and it will certainly look very intimidating. The discrete logic approach shrinks the process. Now you've got one board filled with chips containing one or more logic gates, and the end result is displayed via a CRT. Shrinking the process shrinks the machine. Most electromagnetic games are big for obvious reasons, but discrete logic arcades are mostly regular arcade sized, and also cheaper to make. The discrete logic machine was much more suited for larger distribution, what was really needed to bring arcades to the level of popularity and indeed omnipresence they would reach in the mid 1970s. Of course, no machine sums that up better than the granddaddy of them all, Pong from 1972. So what of Sega's discrete logic efforts? Like just about everyone else, they started with a Pong clone, Pontron from 1973, which helped to bring the game to Japanese audiences. After that, 1974's Balloon Gun takes the first person shooting we've already seen the electromechanical games to discrete logic for the first time. But it's 1976 where we see Sega really embrace the concept. Quite a few of their more famous discrete logic arcades came out in this year. For example, remember Heavyweight Champ? You may know it as an arcade from the 80s, one that's pretty much a clone of Nintendo's Punch-Out. But it's not the original. The original Heavyweight Champ from 1976 is quite a different matter, a game where you pull this big old boxing glove out and then release it as you would a sprint launcher on a pinball table, while also moving it up and down to adjust the glove's position on the screen. Quite a bit more nifty, that. And of course there's one of the first licensed games ever, Fonz. You get to play as Fonz from Happy Days, riding a motorbike using the handlebars and avoiding other bikes on the road. An evolution from Grand Prix, and actually already released under the names of Man TT and Motocross, 
although obviously Lee Fon's branding makes this one stand out a fair bit more. What's notable about these games is that they actually feature Sega's first attempts at sprite scaling, meaning that they are the forefathers to the classic racing games that would come out a decade down the road. 1977's Heli Shooter is another one worthy of mention mainly because, well it's such a freaking cool cabinet. In many ways it's the successor to the old electromagnetic game Rocket Shot, but the cabinet here is much more in line with what you're going to see later. You can make a line from this game to the likes of Afterburner. 1978's Amazonian also belongs here thanks to its awesome big cabinet. Even if discrete logic did help reduce the size of arcades considerably, Sega was still more than happy to produce big arcades that, in the case of this one, still contained physical elements. You do fire an actual bullet at the screen in this game, as opposed to it purely being a light gun affair. 1978, mind you, is the time when fins shrink even further. Arcade games are going digital, and the microprocessors are taking over. Now you can take everything that a discrete logic board does and then some, and shove it into one single integrated circuit. Taito Space Invaders can probably take the most credit for that. Funnily enough, Sega did make a clone of Space Invaders using discrete logic, 1978 Space Fighter, but more and more laid phase out these titles in favour of the new approach. But not before making Monaco GP in 1979, which is by far and away their most famous discrete logic game. A classic and very speedy top down way so that would influence a whole lot of other games. You go from here to Spy Hunter and all sorts. Much like the electromechanical games, a lot of these discrete logic games are of course not available in MAME due to the way that they're made, although in several cases it's easier to find a dedicated emulation of certain titles. If nothing else, there's also ports of a couple of them. Monaco GP can certainly be enjoyed several different ways, from a more contemporary SG-1000 version to a souped up Sega Ages PS2 remake. Certainly without this long history, we miss out on a lot of the context for the titles we're about to see. Sega's tendency to make games that may be a bit light on gameplay, but certainly spectacular in appearance goes way back, all the way to the company's first arcades. This is only a brief summary, and is not meant to be exhaustive, but it's important to note it all as we head into the 1980s, starting with the company's few vector titles. I suppose the vectors here are in an odd place. A lot of them could simply have been included elsewhere, perhaps in the early years video, seeing as they're more in line with conventional machines. But then the vector is in and of itself a presentation largely unique to the arcades, with only one home system, the Vectrex, that was ever dedicated to bringing the vector experience home properly. I think they fit in more here as a result. There were six Sega Vector games, all of which were made using the G80 board, hardware that was designed to be quite versatile and allowed the operators to swap out G80 games very quickly. G80 is kind of a precursor to the Jammer industry standard, although it was only ever used by Sega. Of the six Vector games, one of them, Battlestar, is very obscure and has never been dumped, meaning that we're going to cover five games released between 1980 and 1982. Space Fury from 1981 is the first of the Vector games. On the surface it's not wholly original, you have a ship, you have enemies, and you have thrust controls, so it's a fair bit like Asteroids. In fact, almost all of Sega's Vector games owe a fair bit of depth to Asteroids, they play like variations on the theme. However, Space Fury stands out because the graphics are highly improved, there's a good bit of colour there. And there's also a very cool intro, <laughs> check this fellow out. It's not a bad take on a familiar game, it certainly helps if you really like Asteroids, of course, and I do. Eliminator, also from 1981, is another Asteroids variation. The focus isn't so much on dealing with enemy ships, it's on taking out the big old asteroid that's moving around, that asteroid being the Eliminator of the title. Your shots actually push opponents rather than blowing them up, and you deal with these guys by pushing them into the Eliminator. In fact, the only ways to die are by hitting the Eliminator, or hitting ships that spawn from the Eliminator. Not bad, eh? But single player doesn't do this justice. This is actually a four player game. Yep, much like Hot Rod, four people can gather around a cocktail cab to play this game at once. 
duking it out with each other for supremacy and power. In fact, Eliminator is totally unique, because it's the only four-player vector arcade game ever made. So, congratulations to it for having a spot in arcade history where it stands alone. And now, from 1982, we have by far the most famous of Sega's vector games, Star Trek Strategic Operations Simulator. Naturally, the license has a lot to do with that. While this is far from the first Star Trek game, it's certainly one of the first that wasn't just a load of text on a mainframe computer. It's both fancy and simple in equal measure. You've got a cracking display, speech samples courtesy of Leonard Nimoy, and all these very cool ships flying about in vector mode. There's lovely little effects all over the game. Mind you, the main play window on the top right is where you'll be focusing a lot of attention, as that's how you track and shoot most enemies. And in this regard, Strategic Operations is actually pretty close to being another variation on Asteroids. More thrust controls and a zone of ships to destroy. Obviously that's not a bad thing, especially when it's all wrapped up in such a great pile. Honestly, this is one of my favourite early Sega arcades. I think if I had included this game in the early years Sega list, Star Trek would have most certainly been in the top three. It's bloody great, and one of the best Star Trek games ever. Here's another very cool vector game indeed, Tax Scan. This is the one that's actually not like Asteroids at all, it's a more traditional scrolling shooter only in vector form. It comes with a cool idea though in that you control an entire fleet of ships at once, as many as seven of them. Controlling seven ships makes for a pretty big target and you can obviously expect to lose plenty of them, but rather than just having lives you have a quantity of ships and you can regenerate them as you see fit with the click of a button. Taxcan also has several perspectives and modes of play. There's top down and third person, as well as a flying through hoop section. You got a lot of change ups to keep things fresh. There's not too many shooters like it. We saw Starjacko in another vid, but compared to Taxcan, that feels like a simplification of the concept. Definitely interesting and worth checking out. And lastly we have Zektor from 1982. Zektor is once again a bit of an Asteroids variation. I think it's basically a follow up to Space Fury, what with the similar gameplay and another very cool intro that makes use of speech synth and has a rather intimidating looking fellow asking if you're up to the fight. So you come to take a star back, you'll have to fight for it. The game? Well, it's like Asteroids only with a wall surrounding the play area. The wall doesn't kill you, but you bounce back off of it instead of warping to the other side. It looks freaking awesome, of course. There's something that truly sparkles about vector titles, and the gameplay adds a little touch of the arena shooters to it all, making it feel like a cross between Asteroids and Robotron. Probably the least of the five games here, but this and indeed every other Sega vector title are still recommended. There's certainly no stinkers to be found amongst them. Oh, here's something else that we should quickly look at. Sega did have a little part to play in the glory days of the Laserdisc Arcade. They had their own special hardware for it and everything, and a few games were released using it. Not many of them are particularly famous, it has to be said. Cobra Command, a game by Data East that uses the hardware, is probably the one that most people would recognise, mainly thanks to it getting a Mega CD port. However, while these games still have the general limitations you often find in Laserdisc titles, they do try. Astron Belt, for example, isn't wholly linear and generates scenes at random depending on how the game is played. Still, there's only so much you can do. In many ways though, the games are still quite nice to look at. However, while the original Laserdisc games may not necessarily be standouts compared to the more famous titles in the field, it's worth jumping all the way forward to 1991 and spending a little bit of time talking about Time Traveller. In the last video, we covered a little game called Holoseum. It was a pretty bare bones fighting game, but it was notable because of its holographic cabinet. If you played it on the original hardware, it'd look as though the sprites were actually standing and not just being moved about on a screen. Which is all very nice. 
However, the holographic cabinet was not originally designed for Holosseum, it was made for Time Traveller. This game's pretty ambitious. No less a figure than Rick Dyer, Mr Dragon's Lair himself, was involved in its production, casting actors, filming them on a big old green screen and getting them in his little virtual play. The game was marketed as if it were a controllable theatre piece, taking place on this little stage where you have these real people moving around, only they've been shrunk to about 5 inches tall. It's very nice indeed. Now of course, as with most Laserdisc games, in the end the gameplay comes down to quick time events and ultimately the concept of holographic arcades didn't really catch on. Still it's quite a cool thing to see, even now. Ok, at last, here's what we've been waiting for. The scaling games. The big ones, Sega's signature arcade titles. For all of the great non-scaler games that the company released, it's almost impossible to imagine a Sega that never made any of the Super Scaler games. Just where would they be as a company without them? Would they even still be around? Who knows. Particularly in the mid 80s, the Super Scaler games would help Sega dominate in arcades and game centres around the world, although the process actually started before that. We've already talked about Sega's first attempts at sprite scaling in the discrete logic days, but their second piece of hardware that was designed for sprite scaling came in 1981 with the VCO Object Board. The VCO Object Board only saw the release of four games between 81 and 83, two of which are identical to each other, but they all have a part to play. Previously we had Grand Prix, we had Fonz, we had Monaco GP and we had Night Driver by Atari. But Turbo, from 1981, is considered by a lot of people as the place where racing in the arcades really kicks off. Even if there were games that came before, Turbo was the first third person racing game that was played in colour. This is the best known arcade title from the legendary Sega programmer named Steve Hanawa, who also wrote the likes of Sinbad Mystery, Monster Bash and um, Tranquilizer Gun. It also took the most out of him. Hanawa crunched so hard on Turbo that he ended up in the hospital. Still, he delivered the bomb. It's rather similar in gameplay to Monaco GP in that the main aim is to avoid other cars, but then, well, avoiding obstacles and other cars is primarily what arcade racing is all about, isn't it? It's perhaps a little gore in that Pole Position by Namco, released not too long after, became a much bigger arcade hit than Turbo, to the point where it's often the game credited with popularising racing games. Turbo was a big inspiration to Pole Position, but the switching of scenery in Turbo arguably makes it more advanced. As it is, Turbo still remains a highly influential arcade classic. You can't do too much better than kickstarting an entire genre, after all. Subrock 3D is not quite so influential or well known, but has cool touches of its own. I suppose you could call this a digital update of the ancient periscope. Once again you play as a sub and you fire at enemies for points. It all seems quite generic, but this is another game that's very much married to its cabinet. You play it through a 3D viewfinder that's shaped much like a periscope, meaning that the game itself displays a 3D image. And once again, this was another arcade innovation from Sega. Naturally, you can't get this experience in MAME, but even so it's not bad to play, just quite simple. Not the same without a periscope to control perhaps, but it's all good. The last two VCO object games are the same, although they're pretty well known. Sega released Zoom 909 in Japan in 1982, and this game perhaps represents something a bit new. A very speedy third person flying game largely based in tunnels, with a set of targets to shoot and lots of different scenes that change very quickly, a la Turbo. While you can think of Turbo and Subrock as evolutions of much earlier concepts, Zoom 909 is more like the start of something. This is the beginning of the path towards games like Space Harrier and Afterburner. The building blocks of the gameplay are most certainly there, even if the graphical quality isn't quite there yet. And like those games, Zoom 909 is pretty fun to play even now. Mind you, some of you may think that this game is familiar, but you don't know it as Zoom 909. This game is better known worldwide as Buck Rogers Planet of Zoom. The games are virtually identical, just with a couple of little graphical changes. Sega got the Buck Rogers license shortly after releasing Zoom 909 and decided to rebrand the game. 
This is definitely one of Sega's best known arcades pre-1985. A big hit, and it was also ported basically everywhere at the time, from ColecoVision to Atari 2600, and of course, the ZX Spectrum. Thus beginning a long tradition of home ports of sprite scaling games trying their best even if they hardly did the original title justice. Right, now we get to 1985 and the glory days of the Super Scaler. This was the year where Sega would introduce a brand new 16-bit board for their Scaler games, and while most of the previous Scalers were hits, this would be the game changer. The 16-bit sprite Scaler games were monoliths, there was nothing else in the arcade that could come close to them. Obviously they'd drive a high price too, but pretty much any arcade operator would lap these machines up looking for a premier attraction that, naturally, you could charge a bit more per play for than you could for any regular arcade game. There would be four boards specially designed for Super Scaler games. The first two were specifically designed for one or two games, while the last two tried to fit everything in. The first is either known as the Sega Hanon or Space Harrier board, depending on what game it's run in. If you use that logic I guess you could call it Sega Enduro Racer too, although no one does that. The board itself was designed by the legendary Yu Suzuki and comes with a whopping two 68,000 processors running at 6.2937 MHz as well as the 8345608 Super Scalar video board itself with 16 processors running at 18.811 MHz and the ability to scale 7680 sprites and textures every second. All this was, of course, enough to make it by far the most advanced arcade hardware available at the time. A great deal of the Hanon hardware's design would also inform the System 16 board, although that dropped one of the 68000s in favour of just having one that was clocked faster. The Space Harrier variation, naturally used for Space Harrier, is a little bit different, mostly a load of upgrades, such as two 68000s now running at 10 MHz. 2.6 megabytes of memory, a maximum of 2456 kilobytes of IPROM, a monster of things. Unlike the Hanon board, the Sega Outrun board was only ever used for Outrun games, although there is a version of Super Hanon for the hardware it doesn't make any special use of it. Once again it's a largely upgraded version of the previous board, the dual 68000s have been clocked higher again, hitting 12.5 megahertz. The biggest additions were to the video board, which now uses a much nicer frame buffer system to render sprites out. Lovely. Why go to all this length, mind you? What's the point of all these upgrades? Well, in the main it was used so that two different roads could be drawn in game, thus making the ability to choose where you're going in out one so fluid and, well, possible. The effect in out one where the road splits into two? That would not have been possible on the regular old Hanon board. So now you know. Next up we have the X board from 1987. Finally Sega decide to make a board that's going to be suited for more than just one game, which is naturally what you would have expected them to do eventually. That is after all what they did with the system boards. There's not too much specifically different about this board compared to what we've already seen aside from pure power. The X board was built as an upgrade to the Out One board, and quite a big one to the point where it can actually handle twice the amount of sprites and textures at any one time, jumping up to a maximum of 256 in any given frame. The upgrades on the X board also allowed for a lot more in the ways of sprite manipulation, making for a great deal more variation in games and effects. The most iconic example of this would probably be the super fast sprite rotation in Afterburner. That's the sort of thing the X board could do that the previous boards couldn't. The X board is the most prolific of Sega scalar boards, responsible for nine full blooded arcade video games. And eventually, we get to the Y board. The Y board is actually a little bit different in how it's designed compared to the X board, it's a little bit more than just adding beef. Although, of course, the end result is a total monster. Free. 68,000s, <laughs> that's all you really need to say, and a massively upgraded GPU indeed. How so? Well I previously cooed about how the X can display a maximum of 256 sprites at any one time. Pretty nice, sir. Well the Y board can display 2176. It's kind of a different ball game. 
It can do just about everything that you want from a scalar game, all the manipulation and everything in real time. No mean feat. There's a certain smoothness about the Y games that makes them stand out. There's only six of them, but all of them are just about the beastliest arcades available at the time. You couldn't hope to get anywhere even remotely close to arcade accuracy for any of these games in the home until the PS2 generation. And there, that sums up the boards. Of course it would be rude not to mention the System 32 board as well. While we have already covered the games from that board, the System 32 was designed to finally bring everything all together. Both big sprite scaling games and more regular but very nice looking arcade games in one big old 32 bit package. It did a fine job, of course. Still, I kept it in another video because I wanted this to be purely dedicated to the scalar games only. So, let's look at a lot of them. As a collection they could just about fill an arcade hall of fame entirely on their lonesome. Yu Suzuki's Hanon. <laughs> this is still really something. It may be the first of the super scalers, and it may well have been superseded by many others after, but as soon as that music kicks in, you're just so freaking ready for how brilliant this game's gonna be. Yu Suzuki just got it. He has this innate sense of what appeals to people on a gut level that made his game so good. He wanted to give people that experience of handing off a bike, as it were, even if he got the translation a little wrong. And the beautiful thing about Hanon is that really it works no matter what. Obviously the actual bike cabinet is iconic and the most perfect way to play this game, but Hanon's still awesome when you're playing it on MAME with a controller. It's an arcade classic, of that there is no doubt. Also worthy of a little note is Hanon Jr, the non-superscalar version of the game that was more than a little bit pared down. This actually runs on a board we've not mentioned, the System E board, which is kind of like the System C board in that its insides are basically that of a master systems. So this game isn't exactly a looker or anything, but hey, it's still bloody Hanon and therefore good. And the icons do not stop there. Here it is, one of my all-time favourite arcades. The third-person whale shooter, as introduced in Zoom 909 a couple of years back, goes a whole level beyond in 1986 with Space Harrier, another Yu Suzuki game. This is a concept that had stuck with Suzuki for quite a long time, right from the beginning of his career, but it took until now, a few years down the road, for it to become reality. This beautiful little fantasy zone filled with endlessly memorable creatures, the constant intense gameplay of trying to dodge every freaking obstacle and bullet while taking down as much as you can, an absolute brute of a soundtrack. Ah, it's all just so quintessentially arcade, isn't it? As excellent and as popular as many of the Super Scalar arcade games to come were, there's a strong case to be made for Space Harrier being the definitive one. If I were to do this video as I'd done the previous ones, as a countdown from the worst to the best, Space Harry would unquestionably be my number one. It wouldn't even be close. Every little bit of this game triggers another beautiful memory, right down to all the individual sound effects possessed by each of the monsters and that start-up. Obviously it's got the all-time cabinet to match, a glorious sit-down affair that rolls along with your movements. But it goes without saying that Space Harrier just plays beautifully. This isn't just my favourite Sega cabinet, it's one of my favourite ever arcades. Like, top three for absolute certain. Remarkable. In Duo Racer, as awesome as it may be, sure does have a tough act to follow after we've just looked at Space Harrier. But still, this is another fine game built by Yu Suzuki's love of motorbiking. This time we're going off-road, and there's lots of jumps that provide the main satisfaction here, pulling back on the dirt bike's handlebars so that you get all the distance and sticker landing. 
In Duo Racer is a rock solid game that helps to perfect the scalar formula. Immediately appealing gameplay, excellent graphics for the time, and of course, an absolutely built in soundtrack. As with a lot of Sega sound team work, this doesn't feel like just a regular theme and instead, it feels like an actual song. And of course, many more great examples of that will soon be available. And lastly, for the Hanon board, naturally we have Hanon's big follow-up, Super Hanon. It's much the same gameplay for the most part, but everything's bigger and better. There's way more stages, and indeed multiple courses to choose from, as opposed to the rather small number in the original. There's the turbo feature, allowing you to go even faster. And there's the selection of four utterly iconic video game songs. Naturally it's an even better experience as a result, both here and on the Mega Drive, where the port of Super Hanon is quite possibly the best port for any of the Super Scalar games, at least when it comes to contemporary systems. And of course we should mention Limited Edition Hanon from 1991, a small variation of the game that changes the courses up a little bit to make them a little bit more easy going. This was the final appearance for the Hanon board, a system that is, well, absolutely perfect. There are no bad games here, it's <laughs> they're all gold. So, with that done, it's on to the out one board. And obviously you know what that means. The Yu Suzuki classics just aren't stopping anytime soon. This is, of course, Out One from 1986. The ultimate driving game, the one where you reach the goal with your girlfriend. You've got a time war of course, but you don't have to get a position in a race or anything. You just take your Ferrari Testarossa alike and you drive. Lovely jubbly. It feels so relaxed and natural because, well, this is kind of what Yu Suzuki did to help make the game. He went out to Europe, rented a car, and just drove for a fortnight through Germany, Italy, Switzerland, various other places, recording everything. And when he came back to Japan, the end result of the efforts was out one. Just, ugh, words barely do it justice. It's magic when you get to pick your route and fly on all these different, so iconic areas. It's got the best sound we've heard so far too. The first of these games that allowed us to choose the music we wanted to listen to from free classic gaming tracks. And there's the cabinet, complete with, for the first time in an arcade, force feedback on the steering wheel. There's really not much to say that's bad. I mean, unless you go into the home computer ports of the game that is, <laughs> then there's an entire book of bad things. But this is just dreamy. I think that's the best word for it. Turbo Out One is more of the same in many ways, although it's not quite the big jump from Hanon to Super Hanon. It adds a turbo function, of course, and the ability to upgrade your car between stages, but the almighty graphics were mostly there to begin with. Turbo Out One leans a lot more into the Cannonball One Gumball Rally concept that was actually the original inspiration for the first title, meaning that it feels a bit more like a racing game, kind of somewhere in the middle, between racing and driving. Unfortunately, one result of this is that you no longer choose your route in Turbo Out One. To me, that's kind of a big deal, as choosing your route is one of the fins that makes Out One what it is. And so I wouldn't say this is in any way an improvement over the original. Still, Turbo Out One is a perfectly good driving game. It's right in line with the quality that we've come to expect. It's just not quite as special. Okay, now we move on to the system export. And it couldn't have a much better debut. <laughs> it's time for some afterburner. This is another Sega classic that had a bit of an intriguing journey. Originally it was going to be more of a fantasy effort, primarily taking inspiration from Castle in the Sky. 
However, Finn's changed primarily thanks to Top Gun, as you might expect, and also Yu Suzuki's experiences of being taken up into the air in a fighter jet with an instructor. With this in mind, Suzuki set out to create a perfect and simple arcade flight sim. You've got your F-14 Tomcat alike, and your missiles, and an analog joystick. No fancy complicated controls or anything like that, you're straight into absolutely hair-raising action. So really, Afterburner does follow a similar formula to the other Super Scalar games, only in the air. The beauty of these titles is how they take something that can potentially be quite complicated and they strip it down to a core. All it takes is one quick jerk of the controls in Afterburner and you're barrel rolling all over the shop, dodging bullets while satisfyingly wrecking any enemy planes with missiles every time you get the FIRE command. It's a whopping load of spectacle, more so than any other Scalar game so far, and to the point where a lot of people think that Afterburner is more about that than it is gameplay. And yet it's still got plenty to offer in a much more simple setting, as iconic as the presentation and in particular that rolling cabinet is. I almost feel like a broken record as a lot of it comes down to similar strengths that the other games have, like immediate gameplay and glorious music, but then this is the winning formula that Sega constructed, and Afterburner sums it up as good as any other game really. And of course we do have the second version of the game, Afterburner 2. Despite the name, Afterburner 2 is not so much a sequel as an update on the original, largely consistent of the same stages. However there are some pretty important quality of life additions, the lock-on system has been fine-tuned, the HUD's been rearranged, and you can now control the speed of your jet, which is actually pretty damn useful. All this and the addition of a couple of new stages make Afterburner 2 generally the best way to experience the game, and almost every port of the game is based on Afterburner 2, with the exception of the first port on the Master System. Either way, it's another arcade legend. And here's another one of my favourites. Thunderblade keeps us in the sky, and we're now in a chopper. This one's a bit different to what we've seen already. Thunderblade is a little bit slower paced and switches around a fair bit with both top down sections and third person behind the chopper dealios. The big scalar gimmick here, of course, is that your chopper can change altitude in the top down sections and sink right down into the heat of the action. It has a certain odd vibe, actually, especially with the quite fusion-y music and everything playing as you're blowing everything up with cannons and flying through freaking caves. Even the Japanese flyer for the game is uh, certainly quite interesting. I guess there's no better way to sum up the game's altitude gimmick than having the chopper fly through a lady's long pins, is there? <laughs> All that aside, Thunderblade is bloody brilliant, perhaps less so in the home where it never got a port that was even remotely close but it's champion in the arcades. Right, after a long one of total classics that you no doubt know very well already, here's something different and obscure. The Super Scalar game that you may well not know at all. Which is a shame because it's quite good and very different from basically any other Scalar game. This is Last Survivor, it only came out in Japan, and even then it didn't have a wide release. The one for this game wasn't even dumped until 2012, although weirdly it did get an FM Towns port. Last Survivor is a very early third person shooter where you pick a character, gun down various enemies in order to obtain keys, and then make your way to the exit. Sort of like a 3D gauntlet, complete with enemy generators, treasure and the like. It's a bit slower paced than most third person games, and the rotary controls take a little bit of getting used to, but surprisingly I quite enjoyed playing this game. I found it to be an addictive little title once I got my head around playing it. All the controls you would expect in a third person game, just in slightly different forms. I certainly recommend having a look at this, even if it's just out of sheer curiosity. A very cool experiment, and it looks lovely to boot. Next on the menu we have Line of Fire. Now, okay, to me this is probably the least of all the Super Scalar games, but it's not bad. It's just a bit less original, really. 
Line of Fire is pretty much little but Sega's answer to Taito's Operation Wolf, and while it certainly looks a bit flashier with all its ray casting and whatnot, there's no real denying that Operation Wolf is a far better game to actually play than this. Sega would also make better rail shooters than this one. We've got one coming up later, as well as games like Jurassic Park which are just a lot more memorable. So yeah, Line of Fire just doesn't really stand out from the crowd. They can't all be super duper hits I guess. It was utterly inevitable, with all the awesome driving games we've seen already, that we'd get something based around F1. And of course that ended up being 1989's Super Monaco GP. Obviously this is a name that already carried a lot of weight for Sega. After nearly a decade, this game was marketed as the official sequel to Monaco GP, even though a hell of a lot had happened since then and this game is far, far more advanced. Super Monaco GP is in a little bit of an awkward spot. This is perhaps the only super scalar game that, despite being very fancy and indeed very good, is very much outstripped by its home versions. The Mega Drive game may not have the graphics, but it's a much more complete game with way more than one track. And that's before we get to the even better Ayrton Senna licensed sequel. The original is still cool as a pure arcade experience, mind you. It pretty much does exactly what it says on the tin. Like many other scalers, this would get a big second revision, although the main reason for this was because Sega finally got sued by Philip Morris for their repeated unauthorised inclusion of cigarette advertising thanks to this game, after a company executive just so happened to stumble across it in an arcade. Whoops! GP Rider from 1990 is our next title, and it kind of feels like the game that brings a whole thread together, the link between Super Monaco GP and Super Hanon, mainly because it's a MotoGP game with courses and laps and everything. In the main it does feel like the next step in the Hanon saga, even if it isn't officially part of that series. It's certainly taken another big leap forward in graphics, similar to the gap between the original Hanon and Super Hanon. That aside, it doesn't necessarily do anything new compared to the racing games we've already seen, but it is pleasantly enjoyable. Here's another very cool game indeed that you might not be aware of, and it's certainly a breath of fresh air after so many racing games. AB Cop brings some good old fashioned action to the road. It's the future, you've got an air bike, and you've got to bash the absolute crap out of enemies in a Chase HQ style. Usefully your bike is invincible and can stand up even to the harshest of enemy hits, but there is a time limit to watch out for. You've got to either destroy the quota of enemies or the level's end boss in the allotted time, or it's game over. AB Cop has some very satisfying features indeed. You get some limited jumps to play with that are handy when it comes to avoiding big enemy attacks and getting close in for some bashing, but the most satisfying is triggering the boost, slowing down just a little bit and then hammering the accelerator for a very welcome burst of speed is generally how you want to deal with these enemies, and you're going to need to master this in order to get enough hits on a boss to beat them within the time limit. Overall, this game is freaking awesome! It's not quite so well known, perhaps because it never got ported anywhere, but if you haven't played it, you really ought to. Seriously, it is one of the best Super Scalar games. Racing Hero, on the other hand, perhaps isn't one of the best Super Scalar games, although it's also quite an obscure one. It's not too bad, it's just that it's another motorbike racing game, only this time it's taken from a first person perspective. It feels a bit more forgiving than the other racing games actually. The time limits here are a bit more generous than they are in something like GP Rider where you really need to be good to do so much as finish the first level. You may well find this to be a good thing, and really there's nothing bad about the game at all. A very competently made way so that only suffers because Sega already have a fair amount of these games on the go.
And lastly, we've got the beastly games from the System Y board. And the first one is undoubtedly the best of them, Galaxy Force. Sega AM2's 1988 title was another big step forward. I can't imagine just how advanced this looked back when it was released. All these huge freaking sprites, all this action and moving so smoothly? It must have really been something. And it's certainly a meaty game too. It feels like a big upgrade on the Afterburner formula, with lots of targeting and moving and all of that, but also with the tunnel sections that really flex the system wireboard's muscles. There's a lot of very cool game to go along with the presentation and the really big cabinet, that's for sure. It has one of my all-time favourite Sega soundtracks as well, another awesome jazz fusion type affair, much like Thunderblade. As with Afterburner, when we talk about Galaxy Force, we generally talk about Galaxy Force 2. The game's upgrade came out only two months after the original, and almost every arcade operator made the switch to the new version, making the original Galaxy Force actually quite obscure. Galaxy Force 2 is much the same game in any case, just with the addition of a couple more stages and the fixing of several bugs. This game was so ambitious at the time that no home version was ever going to hope to come close to it, with the Mega Drive version in particular being an utterly miserable experience. However, some platforms do actually punch above their weight with Galaxy Force. Of all platforms, the Amstrad CPC has a really good and playable version of the game. Obviously nowhere close to the arcade graphically, but great for an 8-bit microcomputer. Power Drift, also from 1988, is another great showcase for the system wireboard, mainly just to see how quickly and effortlessly it can manipulate sprites and textures in order to create the game's madcap undulating karting courses. And refreshingly, it's a bit different to the other racing games we've seen thanks to the short courses and not having to deal with a time limit. Instead, this is much more about racing and having to finish third or better on each of the tracks. It's quite a crazy experience and it's very easy to send your kart careering all over the place, especially when you're playing in MAME and the controls aren't exactly easy to emulate, but it's a nice bit of very casual fun wrapped up in a behemoth of a cabinet. They're certainly getting bigger and bigger, aren't they? But now, we reach the lair of the ultimate Sega Super Scalar Cabinet. As mentioned previously, all the way back at the start of the video, G-Lock Air Battle from 1990 marks the debut of the R360. After all this time rolling around with your movement, this cabinet can turn you fully upside down, making for quite an experience, the sort that could easily make people lose their lunch. Naturally, a machine like this came with a very hefty price tag, on worldwide release, an R360 cabinet would set an arcade operator back $150,000 in 1991 money. Adjusted for inflation, that's around 280 grand. So yeah, big bucks indeed. Especially for a machine that you're probably going to have to clean quite a lot of vomit off of. It's hard to really say that G-Lock as a game justifies such a monstrous price tag, even if the cabinet is certainly something else. It is a pretty good flight sim. Much like GP Rider, G-Lock is thought of as an unofficial game in the Afterburner franchise. The main difference is that it's got a slower pace. You have to shoot down a set amount of targets in the allotted time. It doesn't necessarily need the high price cabinet to be fun. I do actually find this game to be enjoyable to play with a bog standard controller in MAME, so it's certainly not a bad game at all. Playing it in the R360 must have been an experience. $150,000 experience? Maybe not, but still bloody cool. <laughs> and then there's Strike Fighter, g Lock sequel. As with many sequels, there's not a whole lot of difference here. It's much the same aim as g Lock, although the stages are certainly different and there's definitely a bit of a graphical upgrade. Oddly, despite being the sequel to g Lock, Strike Fighter was not compatible with the R360 machine. In fact, there was only one other game that was, that being Win War, which we won't see until we cover the Sega Model 3D games. Strike Fighter is more of the same, if you like G-Lock you will like this too, and it's considerably more obscure, however it did get a port of sorts to the Mega CD, where it was renamed Afterburner 3. That's kind of bringing them together.
And lastly, we have Rail Chase from 1991. This is a rail shooter, much like Line of Fire, only a lot better. Part of that has to do with the game's cool Indiana Jones-esque style, but it's just got so much more in the way of neat features. It doesn't feel like it's ripping off anything. Even if it's just little things like shooting a sign in order to change where your minecart goes, it's one of the more satisfying entries in the rail shooter genre. In fact, I'd go as far to say that it's the best of Sega's scalar rail shooters, just getting the edge over Jurassic Park. It's another pretty obscure title that never made it out of the arcades, but worth looking at if you want a cool little light gun game. And with that, we are finished with the Super Scalers. It's certainly been quite a trip. A lot of these games are very well known already, but hopefully we've covered a few interesting facts about them. And, well, it feels like we've managed to cover most everything major from Sega's 2D arcade days. This video links up nicely with the System 32 games we covered in the last one, which represent the final step in Sega's Super Scalar games. Next up, we're going to be going 3D. We're going back to a simple countdown, and we're covering one single board, the STV, which was an awful lot like the Sega Saturn, and had a lot of games made for it. Hopefully you'll join me again for that, but for now it's time to leave you alone for a wee bit and just come down for a space. Bye for now! Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video then hey, please do like it and if you really like me, subscribe to my channel, have a look at my social media links, have a look at my Twitter, have a look at my Twitch, hit that bloody notification bell and all that other good vlogger stuff. And if you really like what I do, perhaps you might want to have a look at my Patreon. You can find exclusive videos, you can find wrestling documentaries, and you could join this list of very awesome people right here. Alexa Jones Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Arcade LY Webmaster, Asobi Quan DX, Brian Henniger, Chris Conrad Pritchard, D Xulior, Remon Sutter, Tagaraf Dungeon Keeper, Daniel Lomez, Daddy Wolfers, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dinty76538, Dustin Cooper, Gary Samaden, Geordie Alex, Glunfef, Jay as Manchild, James Brown, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lucas Kaligowski, Matthias Gramzov, Michael Halliday, Mike Clayton Travis, Martin Pataki, Nate Milbank, Neem Kieran, Peter Margell, Renbimon, Robert DeFelice, Rusty Kelly, Seth A. Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Tarek Amir, Tim Wald, Yurka Operator, and to all the rest of the glorious community. Thank you so much and goodbye.